this research at Bangalore event. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will talk about our efforts in the domain of democratizing these large language models to a variety of settings, like for example, like you know how to run them on neural accelerators or on like small devices to work them in a variety of domains, like maybe vision specific domains or language model specific domains, as well as to a variety of deployment scenarios, like do you want real time solution or do you want a batch mode kind of solution? Now these models seem to unlock very special and exciting skills as we scale them. So one of the most critical questions in democratizing these models and exploiting these skills is how can we optimize the inference of these models so that they can be used effectively in multitude of these scenarios. Okay. Now let's be clear, there has been decades worth of excellent research in the domain of systems and machine learning to come up with more compressed ML models and reduce their floating point operations or computation operations. And successful techniques here include distillation, pruning, compression, whatnot, right? However, as LLMs are essentially trying to memorize this entire world's information, that means that if you want to compress them or prune them, it might lead to significant loss in performance. Furthermore, many times just reducing the floating point or computational operations of these large language models is not enough because our modern accelerators can paralyze operations very well and can pack in a bunch of floating point operations very well. So we need to rethink about these problems from scratch. So what I am advocating is drilling deeper into these large language model architectures, designing inference optimization techniques from scratch for these models and for specific hardware. So let's take a closer look at how these generative LLMs work. Suppose we are given a uh, query or a prefix, right? Then most industry grade LLMs generate these uh, tokens one by one uh, in an autoregressive manner, right? And within each token generation itself, when we look at what is being computed, well, it turns out that a bunch of attention computation is being done, followed by feed forward. And then in the end, we apply this large softmax layer to predict a distribution over next tokens. Now, this prefix or query processing requires running a lot of computation operations, right? But most of these computation operations are parallelizable, which means that on our modern accelerators, we can compute this prefix work pretty easily, like with very low latency. On the other hand, autoregressive generation, which requires actually an order of magnitude or even two order of magnitude smaller amount of computation operation, ends up taking most of the latency requirement. That is, in many of the standard settings, this autoregressive generation takes almost 90% of the latency, and prefix generation is accounting for almost 10% of latency only, which is quite counterintuitive, right? Now, well, a team at Google has been trying to fix this issue uh, through a variety of ideas, right? So for example, we have a technique called tandem, which is able to reduce the inference latency of palm to style models by as much as 2.4x without any quality degradation. Then we have a technique called treeformer that can make this attention computation to be significantly more cheaper for very large context length. This is quite handy when you have scenarios like retrolog augmented models, where a lot of context needs to be put in the uh, LLM so that it can uh, learn and attend to those contexts. So Treeformer is able to uh, solve that problem significantly. And then we have this technique called Heap, which is able to address this issue of memory boundedness of these feed forward and softmax layers. What I really mean by that is that uh, when we look at these feed forward and softmax operations, they are mainly large matrix vector operations. And here, most of the time, our accelerator, like a GPU or TPU, is sitting idle. It is just waiting for the large model matrix to be transported from the RAM or the main memory of the device onto a cache sitting on the device, right? So it is sitting idle. Heap is able to address this issue up to some extent by using a variety of new ideas. Now in the next few minutes, I will provide a few more details about Tandem. So in Tandem, we basically disaggregate these decoder-only LLMs into two components. We have a primary model, which is essentially doing natural language understanding. That is, it is taking the prefill or the query, and it generates representations for that query. right? And then we have a secondary model, which is doing the actual natural language generation. That is, it is generating the actual tokens. right? So imagine this primary model to be a very large capacity model, say a LAMA 70 billion parameter model. And the secondary model to be a much smaller model, maybe a LAMA 7 billion parameter model or a 1 billion parameter model. right? And to ensure that the secondary model can uh, attend to and exploit these representations of the primary model, we have a projection layer sitting between them. Right? 
So now one obvious question is, can the secondary model adapt and in fact uh, use these primary model's representations to provide more accurate outputs? Well, no prizes for guessing that the answer is yes. So we have this tandem technique, which is in, on multiple benchmarks, is able to perform much, much better than the secondary model in terms of accuracy, and is actually much closer to primary model, right, in terms of its quality. And furthermore, it can provide a significant speed up of primary model. That is, it can be 2.5x faster, let's say, right? So that's great. But still here we are fighting two battles, right? That is, we reduced our accuracy up to some extent while gaining latency. So it's not clear like, you know, uh, how to do an apple to apple comparison here. So this problem we can reduce by saying that let's fight only one battle. We will only fight the latency battle. We want our output to be exactly same as that of, that of the primary model. So how do we do that? Well, for that we can combine tandem with this technique called speculative decoding or speed, which was also designed by my uh, colleagues at Google. So uh, in speculative decoding, what we are doing is through this secondary model, we are speculating a bunch of tokens that the primary model will generate, right? And once these tokens are generated, we will run a primary model to verify what all tokens are correct. And wherever we find a mismatch, we will then go to that point and start generation from there on, right? So here, just to take an example, we have, uh, let's say, this query which is described the Himalayas. For that, the secondary model says that the output should be Himalayas is a range, right? Now, after generating these four tokens, we will pass them through the primary model, and primary model says the Himalayas is a good um, set of tokens, but mountain is what you should have instead of range, right? So we have a mismatch at this fifth token. So we will say that, okay, at this fifth token, we will backtrack, and we'll start generating new tokens from that point on, right? So this ensures that the quality of this model is exactly the same as that of primary model. And now the main game is latency. That is, if the secondary model is able to propose or guess what primary model is going to generate for the next few steps, then we are good to go. We will have very good latency reduction. And that is precisely what we have. That is, by using secondary model of tandem, we are able to guess primary model's output almost 4.3 times out of 5, right? And that can then ensure that we have a speed up of almost 2.4x over the basic uh, primary model, while ensuring that the output is exactly identical to that of large primary model. So that's great. We have like, you know, this tandem style of technique that can reduce latency significantly without affecting quality, right? But I would sort of wager that inference optimization is not the only key requirement in democratizing LLMs. There are many other aspects. One of them is that of including flexibility of LLM, right? So for example, if you take a step back here, how does our LLM work? Like how are they deployed in practice? So what happens is we have some sort of deployment constraints that are predetermined. We figure out that based on our like, you know, data center or uh, clusters and all, we can support this much RAM, we can support this much of latency, et cetera, right? And based on that, we will say that from the set of models that we have available, so let's say our Palm 2 set of models, let's say this particular Bison model or Otter model fits best for me, right? So while I might have capacity for a larger model, just because I'm restricted to these four models, I have to pick one of them, right? So the question that we are asking is, can we design LLMs in a way so that we don't have to force fit these models or our application into the available set of models. That is, can we have a scenario where we can have a universal model from which we can read of whatever model you want for the application that you have? Right? And that is where Matformer comes into picture. Right? So Matformer is a new transformer block where a bunch of transformer blocks are embedded within each other. So for example, our transformer Excel block has a transformer L block embedded or nested within it. And within transformer L block, there is a transformer M block and transformer S block, right? So we can have this nested structure embedded within transformers. Now what we can do is we can stack these different sized blocks together to form different sized models. So we can have, say, uh, stack all the S sized blocks to get a model S, all the Excel sized blocks to have model Excel. All these are sort of embedded within each other, so that's great. But I am giving you still only four options. So where is this sort of, you know, big flexibility goal being satisfied here? 
So that is where another key idea comes into picture, which is that of mix and match. That is, suppose I want a six-layer transformer architecture. What I can do is in the first layer, I can have a transformer M block. In the second layer, I can have a transformer S block and so on, right? So I have exponentially many models to choose from. So I can cover a pretty wide range of sizes, right? And I can deploy them. But one worry is that I did not really train for those weird mix and match models that I'm generating. I just trained for four models. So why should my uh, LLM perform po properly on those uh, weirdly generated models? Well, that is where a little bit of magic happens. That is what we observe is that our baseline models, our anchor models like um, XL model, L model, M model, and S model, not only they are very accurate compared to a baseline architecture which is trained from scratch, we are able to observe that these mix and match models that are represented by stars here, they are also working almost as good as what we could have hoped for. So that means that we can basically train just one large model, and we can train hundreds or thousands of these smaller models, which are working pretty well, right? And the exciting thing about Matformer is that it is not specifically restricted to, say, language domain. Uh, it can be applied to vision. It can be applied to multiple sort of deployment scenarios. That is, it, cannot, it can also be used for retrieval. It can also be used for embedding generation. It can also be used for your, let's say, image classification. So in summary, we are advocating for LLM-specific inference optimization techniques as a key aspect of democratizing these LLMs. And another key aspect that we are advocating is that of flexibility, right? And that we believe like, you know, would be important to ensure that these large language models can be democratized to multiple scenarios and applications. Thank you so much for your time. Happy to chat more about these topics during breaks.